As you may know, I used to be an educator at the University of Oxford Brookes, as well as City University of London. When the pandemic started, I pivoted to making online videos, and I've been working as an independent educator ever since. Today, we are in beautiful Seattle, Washington. It is a lovely Monday morning. And if you'd like to drop a comment letting me know where you're joining me from, that would be absolutely lovely. I always get a real kick from seeing where you guys are joining me from. So please do comment where you're, where you're tuning in from. I'm happy to, happy to give everybody a shout out. Today, we're gonna to be spending 50 minutes in an introductory philosophy lecture. I'm gonna be covering some Ratatouille. I'm gonna be covering some Proust, some Thomas Mann. We're gonna discuss the Greek notions of Kairos and Kronos, some Plato and Kant along the way. So tune in for that. Uh, I see Thailand, Thailand, Jordan, Romania, Netherlands, Huya Morcha, Chicago, Greece. Hello, everybody. It's so wonderful that you're joining me. Warwick. Uh, Warwick is actually a wonderful university. University of Warwick, Turkey, Maribah, Moldova, Dubai. Haider says, is there hope for me? I believe there is always hope for everyone. Um, Florida, Brazil, Jason from Florida is here. More Thailand, Greece. That's wonderful. Thank you guys so much. Uh, very briefly, I'd like to say that I've recently launched an Instagram subscription service where I'm posting daily reading recommendations as well as daily intro to philosophy clips designed for beginners. This is very much focused on entry level knowledge. And so if you'd like to learn more about philosophy with me each and every day in bite-sized format, please do head over to Instagram and consider becoming a subscriber today. It's made me very happy that so many people have joined already. And I think that we have a wonderful virtual classroom and community there. On that note, also a huge thank you to the patrons who continue to fund this lecture series through YouTube. Thank you everybody on YouTube for continuing to support this open access learning channel. And if you'd like to download my ebook, as well as the audio without ads for all of these lectures, plus edited transcripts and more, please go to www.patreon.com forward slash Jeneline and Julia. Okay, so hope that you're settled in. We're about to begin. Make yourself comfortable. Uh, shout out to Murad. Sure, absolutely. I hope I pronounced that, that right. Um, so today we're going to be having a 50-minute lecture in which I'd like to talk a little bit about the difference between Kronos and Kairos, which are two sort of elemental concepts within the history of philosophy that will help you immensely if you understand them when it comes to understanding pretty much any other philosophical theory. Now, very basically, the difference between Kronos and Kairos can be put like this. Kronos is the linear progression of time. Like, for example, you're born. This is the classic riddle. Like, what is, what is, this, what is the being which is born on four legs then grows into two legs and ends its life on three legs. It's the classic riddle from antiquity. And of course, the answer is man. Man is he who starts crawling on all fours, then as an adult walks on two legs, and finally as an old man walks with a cane. Here we have Kronos, the linear progression of time from the cradle to the grave. Now, for Kairos, which is sometimes characterized as deep time, is a very different notion of what time is. It can be both the time that is immeasurable, like an era, like something that doesn't have a clearly delineated period. So of course, the you could think, for example, of how the Nazi regime tried to depict the Nazi Reich as being part of a thousand year empire spanning back into the past and into the future. You could also think about the opening to Star Wars, the famous opening in a once upon a time in a galaxy far, far away. Deep time is not about the linear progression of time, but it's about the, what you might call the temporal problem of time itself, which is what is the fundamental mooring of time? What is time attached to? What is time even? Now, in this lecture, I'm gonna to try to give you some examples of this in a way that's hopefully intuitive and accessible and enjoyable, and that will hopefully enrich your own understanding of philosophical ideas in a way that you can bring back to literature and art and your life and cinema. Okay, let us begin. <clears throat> One of my theories is that the most important parts of any work of art, the essence, if you will, tends to carry over into other forms of art. Think about, for example, 
Ratatouille. Pixar's Ratatouille. Perhaps the most memorable sequence in that entire film is the one in which the critic eats, a, eats food that is being served to him, and in the moment of eating, Ratatouille, I believe it is Ratatouille, right? In the moment of eating this food, he suddenly has this flash of recollection. He's transported back to his youth. And suddenly this austere, thin man who, when asked why he is so thin, says that he's, he's so thin because he never swallows unless he thinks the food is perfect. In other words, this real thin, critical connoisseur, this gourmand who doesn't really enjoy food but enjoys tearing other people apart. This man is suddenly reduced to a little child, having strong emotions and recollections about his upbringing and the kind of country food that he remembers eating. It's almost like in that scene, which you may well know, something inside of him is unlocked, some kind of core or deep memory, which reduces him back to his childlike self. Now, of course, any, let's say, French person or any scholar watching this movie will, will immediately recognize that the sequence is none other than the famous Proustian sequence of the Madeleine in Pixar's form. That Pixar has simply taken one of the most famous passages in the history of literature and turned it into something that is accessible, that everybody can universally understand. Now, what's interesting about the scene in which Proust, or, you know, his character, eats the Madeleine which I can, if, you, if you're not familiar with it, I can sketch it to you very quickly. It's, it occurs fairly early in the book In Search of Lost Time, which if you pick up an old translation will also be called In Remembrance of Things Past. In Search of Lost Time, we have multiple, of course, um, uh, philosophical thoughts about the nature of time and the passage of time and how we cannot truly ever be aware of it. Like page one of In Search of Lost Time, we find the narrator reading but whilst he's reading, he's falling asleep. And whilst he's falling asleep, he's thinking about other things which bring back recollections of his former room in which he used to fall asleep as a child. You can already see how we're stuck in this like multiple layers, this mille feuille, to keep the culinary references alive, of associations related to time, how time eats itself, how time is never simply linear, but constantly gorging upon its own self. It's also why Adorno characterized Beethoven as someone who took the linearity out of music, that he destroyed time, that in Beethoven's piano work, we have time folding in upon itself as if the piano were playing itself in a kind of foreshadowing of those eerie, eerie automata that we see today where the piano is mechanized playing itself. However, in Proust, we see one of the, in one of the opening chapters, we have a... Uh, madeleine, which is consumed. And a madeleine is a small French um, pastry, sort of a little bit like what Americans might refer to as tea cake, and it comes in a little clam, or clam shape. And as soon as Proust eats it, he suddenly has a recollection, a recollection of his aunt, and his aunt sitting in the upper room, and his aunt having, you know, the, 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 uh, the madeleine brought every day. However, what's really key here, if you go to that passage, is that it's not simply the smell of the pastry that evokes memories in Proust. It's not simply that he's transported back to his childhood. It's specifically the combination of the madeleine dipped in tea. The combination of those two things evokes something. And of course, you'll, you'll know this from your own life, right? That there are certain muscle memories and certain olfactory memories, by which I mean things that you smell that will immediately transport you back to another time, like the way in which the, the smell of your parental home, for example, when you return home after a long absence, it hits you like something eerily familiar, but also strange to you at the same time. Something both unwelcome and yet deeply pleasant. However, what's key in the passage about Proust with the Madeleine is that he has this flash, this recollection, and then he really struggles to recreate it. And here we have, in a sense, what makes Proust a non-sentimental writer. This is so key because if Proust were simply writing a, a novel about the passage of time, we would be stuck in what is essentially a highly um, 
a highly uh, 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 sort of over-romanticized, overly sentimental novel. Oh, everything used to be better in the past and nothing is good anymore and if only I could relive my childhood and oh, what a loss it is to have lost one's youth, etc. It would be garbage, frankly. It would not be very good. Instead, with the Madeline sequence, it's not simply reminiscing about his childhood. Instead, the, the, what makes the passage so interesting is that he cannot recreate it. That as soon as he has this flash, this memory associated with the Madeline, he then tries to recreate it. He then tries to dip the Madeline in tea again and take another bite. And he describes it as that every time he does this, the memory fades away a little bit more. In other words, the memory becomes itself subject to the passage of time. It loses its potency the more he dips back into it. And so he can never recreate the essence of that memory because, and this is where we end up almost in a platonic metaphysical argument, as soon as he tries to recreate the memory, he is stuck in a memory of a memory. And here we have the theme, the central theme within Proust's writing, which turns out not to be time, but it turns out to be memory. In other words, it's not chronos, it's not the passage of time. Instead, it is kairos. It is deep time, the experience of time, the time of time itself, if you will, the temporal element that lies within time itself. And of course, this is, again, the central theme of Proust, not simply the recollection or the remembrance of things past, but the search for lost time, that time is in and of itself always already lost, that as soon as you become aware of time, you're strictly speaking simply aware of the passage of time. Now you can go back to understanding why Plato, for example, argued that philosophy was none other than preparing yourself for death. That seems very dark if you think about it, like, wow, you wouldn't live your life because you're contemplating death, and yet that's fundamentally not what it is. The essence of what it means to be alive is to be aware that you are a finite being, that as soon as you are born, whether you chose to be born or not, and of course all of us chose not to be born, that you are placed on a temporal sequence in which inevitably there will be an end point, and you have to make sense of what your role is why you are here on Earth. It's the essential existential question. What do I do with the time that is given to me? <clears throat> now, I want to relate this actually to something else. We can bring it back to Plato in a moment. There's another great sequence in one of my favorite writers at uh, one of his books. Uh, you may know that Thomas Mann, the German author, is one of my favorites. And in the Magic Mountain, in the beginning of the Magic Mountain, which is one of his most famous novels, although one of his later novels, he has a flashback, a memory sequence, in which the protagonist remembers being a child living with his grandfather. And at a certain point, the grandfather brings out a silver plate, a bowl, really, a silver dish. And this silver dish is a kind of family heirloom, a relic, as it were, something which has been passed down from generation to generation, going back hundreds of years. And once the boy inspects the dish, he realizes that there are names inscribed on this dish, this bowl. And the grandfather explains to him that each name on the bowl corresponds to one of the owners of this dish, this bowl, which has been passed down from generation to generation. Now, what is the purpose of the dish? Well, it is a baptismal dish. In other words, in the family lineage, when a child is baptized, the child is held above this bowl and water, holy water, is trickled down onto the child. He is baptized. And the grandfather explains to the boy that not only was the boy baptized whilst being held over this family heirloom, but that the grandfather himself had been baptized over the same bowl. It's a beautifully dizzying image of a bowl that becomes the central site in which the elderly man has been baptized as well as the young man. And of course, Thomas Mann, being keenly aware of this, then goes on to reflect on the other names, 
that it is first the father, then the grandfather, then the great-grandfather, and then the great-great-grandfather, and so on and so forth. And this word great is a fixation for Thomas Mann because the great, rather than being an indicator of the true length of time, is in fact a symbolic marker of the impossible realization of time, that once you go past three generations, it becomes dizzying. In fact, he describes it as an abyss, that the boy looks at this dish in which he sees only his own reflection and sees within his own reflection mirrored back to him the reflection of eight other generations before him. And that he experiences a contradictory sensation, which is on the one hand the sensation of feeling both deeply immersed in the past, like he has purpose, that he is part of a lineage, a long fa arching family branch, family tree, and yet fundamentally also feeling like he is losing himself, like he is no longer real, like his life has suddenly been reduced to a mere drop in the ocean, that he is simply but a name to be yet inscribed into the dish. And here we have a beautiful, to my mind, evocation again of the difference between Kronos and Kairos, where Kronos is simply the linear pursuit of time, the linear development of time, which we see symbolized through the names inscribed into the baptismal dish. But then we also have Kairos, which is the problem of the dish itself, which is both the abyss of time that you fall into and the well of time out of which you appear to emerge. It's a very, very beautiful sequence. And of course, uh, for those of you who are familiar with Thomas Mann's writing, Thomas Mann is famous for being an ironist. That Thomas Mann's irony is well, um, <clears throat> let's say it is well honed. And of course, this entire sequence, which again would risk being sentimental, after all, if it were simply about the grandfather presenting a family heirloom to a child, we would have a sentimental sequence not unlike Disney's The Lion King, in which Mustafa shows young Simba all of the prairies that he will rule someday, etc. We sort of have the high um, melodramatic schmaltz of these films. <clears throat> Although I don't dislike The Lion King, I think it's an interesting film. Um, certainly more akin to Shakespeare than it is to akin to Thomas Mann. There's no, no room for irony in, <coughs> excuse me, no room for irony in The Lion King. Excuse me. Now, What's interesting, oh, sorry, yes, I was gonna explain Thomas Mann's irony. So what is the ironic element in this sequence about the baptismal bowl? Well, Thomas Mann's irony is, of course, that whilst we're immersed in this story about the, the patriarch who demonstrates to the son this aristocratic family heirloom that symbolizes, symbolizes the full weight of the family lineage over time, sort of very pompous, right? The irony for Thomas Mann is that the true relic is not the baptismal dish, the true relic is, of course, the grandfather himself, the grandfather who places importance on such things, knowing full well that times are changing, that pretty soon nobody is going to have a baptismal dish because you could simply take a photograph at the baptism itself, that the grandfather is a relic of everything that is about to be passed on rather than passed down. And the reason that Thomas Mann is aware of this, and it's not just me making this up, is that immediately following the sequence, the grandfather passes away. Spoilers for the Magic Mountain. The grandfather passes away, and he himself is laid to rest in state. So he is lying in the room, dressed in his most fine clothing, high collar, you know, one of those aristocratic starched collars. And the young boy, comes and sees the grandfather. And he thinks to himself how beautiful the grandfather is in death, that in a sense, the living grandfather had been a fake, had been an imperfect copy, and that in death, the grandfather represented everything that the grandfather should be, that he was rendered perfect, a symbol of grandfatherness, even though he was lying there as a corpse. In other words, Thomas Mann equates the grandfather's dead body with the family heirloom, the baptismal dish. 
in which time seems to both stop, expand, and also contract. That is Thomas Mann's irony. And it's interesting because here we can actually relate it to a Lacanian principle. Within Lacanian psycho psychoanalysis, we have a very interesting theory of the sublime. We can in fact see three different theories of the sublime. In the Burkean sublime, we have the romantic notion of the sublime, namely that the sublime is something that trickles down from the heavens. In other words, we have an ideal form, a godly divine essence, and that when we see beauty in the world, that we see a reflection of this divine thing. Let's, see, let's say you see a really, really beautiful tapestry, craftsmanship, or perhaps even a beautiful woman or a beautiful man. And you say, ah, here on this earthly example of beauty, we have a reflection of everything that is beautiful about God. This is what I call the trickle-down theory of divinity that beautiful people are blessed by God and that beautiful art is blessed by God, etc. right? This is the Burkean notion of the sublime, that the sublime is everything that contains within traces of the divine or the absolute. Now, within Kant, we get the Kantian sublime, which is already a problematization of this, because if you're familiar with Kant, and even if you're not, that's okay, the Kantian argument is essentially that we don't really access the absolute. We can't really know what God wants, which also means that we can't really know what God thinks is beautiful. So how can we attribute to God something which is distinctly earthly? After all, if essence is ideal and in the sky, then how would it trickle down onto certain people or into certain things? There's, this is also why the Catholic Church was quite right to see Kant as a threat. Because even though Kant was himself a religious person, the Kantian critique is a critique into the conditions by which essence might be known. That is, after all, the critique of pure reason. It's simply to say, how can reason be pure, or how can we know the pure if it has already been contaminated by reason? If something is supposed to be pure and absolute, then how is it that when we think about it, aren't we already turning it into a concept? Isn't it therefore always already impure? Isn't the very idea, the conceptualization, of essence or purity itself an impure practice? It's a pretty radical thing. It's like the, the, the you know, there is there is heresy there that is in plain sight for Kant, even though he himself doesn't fully realize it. And so the Kantian theory of the sublime is to say that we actually see, whenever we see something that cannot be fully reconciled with, something that feels irreconcilable with the absolute, that it is then that we are in the presence of God. For example, this is where we have the romantic image of the storm being sublime. Here we see Burke and Kant colliding, that within the storm, we don't see the beautiful coming down or trickling down from God. We see that which is overwhelming and irredeemable within the idea of God. Of course, from a very dark and pessimistic sense, you could argue, therefore, that evil is itself sublime. That evil, the suffering of children, for example, or the you know, the collective political machinations required to extinguish other human beings, that whenever we're confronted with evil, we see, therefore, a form of the sublime. We see something that is irreconcilable with the idea of the absolute. How can God exist if a child of four can have brain cancer, etc.? However, without wanting to deviate too much into um, theosophy here, of course, this is also the dialectic of good and evil whether evil is necessitated by good and whether evil is in fact a refraction of the absolute good. That's for another time. Now from the Burkean to the Kantian sublime, although, you know, I should actually, I mentioned the pessimistic version of Kantian Kant sublime, but there's also an optimistic version, which is, you've probably heard this from me before. Whenever you tell someone that you love them, but you love them so much that you cannot put it into words, here you have the Kantian sublime. When you say, I love you so much that I cannot properly put it into words, Shakespeare's sonnet, I don't know, 34 or something, right? Is your, that's the Kantian sublime. You've just put into words the fact that you cannot put into words how much you love them. In other words, you've just symbolized the impossibility of symbolizing your love. And that is more romantic than saying, how much do you love me? Well, I love you X amount. I love you three remote controls and four camels much. No, you say, I cannot possibly put into words how much I love you, thereby you have demonstrated to them how much you love them, which is you cannot express it. 
Here we have again the Kantian sublime, which is that something contains in its content the impossibility of the reconciliation between its form and its content, to put it in technical terms. Um, hence also why, for example, for Adorno, there is something sublime about society, because a society, by virtue of being an open democratic society, is precisely a society in which there is no clear sense about what the people is. There's no clear sense about the, the leader having embodied the will of the people. In fact, this is the, the primordial distinction between a totalitarian system and an authoritarian system. An authoritarian system is one in which the ruler rules absolutely, but against the will of the people. A totalitarian system is one in which the ruler rules absolutely, but has convinced everybody that he is the embodiment of the will of the people. It's a, it's a small distinction, but really, really crucial. Am I acting against the people or am I acting as the people? The central democratic principle, on the other hand, is precisely that the people doesn't know what it wants and that hence we need to have representative um, democracies in which we try to hash out compromises and figure out what we can do that benefits the most and hurts the least, etc. Here we have the democratic impossibility or the democratic sublime, which is that the whole point of democracy is that strictly speaking, it has to be a failure. It is not going to make everyone happy and it will not always fully represent the idea of the people. In fact, the very idea of a democracy is the institutionalization of the absence of a collective will that can be directly transmuted onto something. You could also say in psychoanalytic terms that democracies are innately neurotic that we revolve around the central problem of what it means to live in a society and be part of a nation and what our principles and our actions and our laws and our ethics should be, that the irreconcilability between our idea of collectivity and the actual manifestation of our political intent is therefore what makes democracies function, what makes them sublime. Now we can finally get to the Lacanian idea of the sublime. Lacanian idea of the sublime is the object, this is the definition, the object elevated to the level of the thing. What is an object elevated to the level of the thing? Well, strictly speaking, it is a relic. As soon as you take something ordinary and you elevate it to the level of the thing, like the religious thing, it's like you've taken the, uh, I don't know, the collarbone of a saint and you keep it in a church and you worship it. Now, strictly speaking, this is just a piece of, you know, calcium, essentially, it's bone, it's not divine in any way. It's not even written in the Bible that collarbones are sacred. Instead, when you take something that is an ordinary object and you elevate it into an object of worship, you therefore have what Kant calls the sublime. We have this in many ways, like what else is celebrity culture? If not the elevation of an ordinary human being into some kind of superhuman entity. What else is, again, to go back to the theme of time, sentimentality is a version of the sublime. Something becomes important to you because you've had it for a long time. This is one of the ironies of often when it comes to like inheritance is you live in your parents' house and there's all these things that they don't, that they think are important that they may have inherited from their parents, like, I don't know, a sculpture or a vase or, you know, bookshelf or whatever. And you think it's not like, why would you be attached to this thing? It's old, it's crusty. And then when your parents pass away, suddenly you too become sentimental about it. It's like you've inherited the object, but with it, you've inherited the sentimentality. In other words, what is inscribed in the object is not the presence of any formal content that makes it special, but the absence of the memories and the people that we associate, which renders retroactively the thing memorable and cherishable. In other words, when it comes to sentimentality, we're never simply dealing with the symbolic presence of a thing. We're dealing with the symbolic presence of an absence. That's why sentimentality exists on the level of melancholy. For those of you who have watched these lectures before, you'll know that melancholy is simply falling in love with your own pain. Think about it, when you're in a relationship, for example, and your relationship ends, and at that point you feel in pain. Of course, you're missing that person, and yet, in order to move on, in order to find somebody new, strictly speaking, you have to fall out of love, right? This is the double loss that is implied in any breakup. First, you lose the person, but then you also, in some sense, need to lose your affection for them so that you can love someone else. However, many people are not capable of this. 
And so what happens is that after a breakup, you hold on to your pain. You fall in love with your pain. You think to yourself, well, at least if I can't have you, at least I can have my pain. You start worshiping memories that you used to have of them. It's like bereaved parents who leave their child, who lose a child. One of the most tragic things that can happen, of course, and then leave the childhood bedroom intact as if the child might someday return. This inability to move on is therefore taking the object and elevating it to the level of the thing, except it takes the object of pain and elevates it to the level of the thing. In other words, you become a martyr for your own pain. You worship your pain, you take care of it, you caress it, you cherish it. And above all, you become deeply protective of it. People become protective of their own pain because they feel that if they lose their pain, they will have finally lost the thing that they lost in the first place. This is the double loss that occurs in all heartbreak. Of course, this is the double loss that occurs within time as well. As soon as you have lost something, namely the moment in which you were living, this is the passage of all time. As soon as you have a memory of it, you are therefore already on the level of the sentimental melancholic. Because think about it, what happens when you have a memory? Yes, you're living in the past, but really what you're doing is you're cannibalizing your own time. If time is a linear progression that moves forward, a temporal sequence starting at one and ending in, I don't know, 99, then as soon as you start living in the past, as soon as you start having a memory, it's like the progression of time is no longer moving forward, it's moving backwards by means of moving forward. In other words, a movement that is neither forward nor backwards. This means that within time, within the progression of time, sentimentality and melancholy presents a false infinity, a false eternity. This is the temptation of losing yourself in time, of losing yourself in memory, because it feels like a reprieve. It feels like within a memory, you're living forever, like time has stopped. And yet, of course, you're still moving forward. It's just time is moving forward and you're no longer on board that train. And this is how people can cannibalize their own life. They can consume themselves. They can become the guardians of their own pain and their own memories. They become sentimental melancholics who are incapable of moving forward. Remember, paralysis is never the end of time or the stopping of time. Paralysis is that you no longer flow with time. And personally, on a side note, I believe that this is one of the dangers as you get older, because as you get older, by virtue of having lived another day, it means that the well of time that lies behind you has thereby grown another day. Thereby, as you age, the temptation to sink into your memories becomes ever greater. And yet, there's a principle here that I'd like to explain for those of you who make who know, uh, if you're familiar with rock climbing, this will make sense to you. <clears throat> and if not, I'll try to explain it. When you're rock climbing and you're on the wall, let's say that I'm gonna gesticulate here. So apologize for apologies to people who are listening to this and not watching it. Let's say that you're here and you're rock climbing and you've climbed five meters or I don't know, whatever, five feet from the point where, where your anchor is. Let's say that you fall, you fall down. You're still connected to the anchor here. The key thing for climbers, all climbers know this, is that you never simply fall five feet to where you're anchored. You fall at least 10 feet. Because think about it, you've gone up five, and so the length of your rope will descend with you. And so you're falling at least 10 feet, even though you're anchored in at five feet. And then there's the rope being elastic. So of course you fall more than 10 feet, could easily be 15 feet. And so what ought to be a five foot fall can easily become a 15 feet fall. The same is true for time. As soon as you engage in sentimental, melancholic behavior, as soon as you become lost in memory, you're not simply going back, let's say five years. If you spend five years feeling melancholic, it's like you've lost 10 years. You've gone back five years, but you've also lost the five years that you were supposed to be moving forward. And so melancholy becomes something that not only cannibalizes time, but it actually seems to expand time. And this is, of course, what's so dangerous about it, is that while you're melancholic, 
it feels like time expands, even though, strictly speaking, your linear time is shrinking. Hence also why we have these truisms about living in the moment and the eternity of the moment. And yet, the devious thing is that we cannot fully grasp the moment except in the moment that it has already passed. It's continuously slipping through our fingers. In fact, to speak about time, to philosophize about time, is itself, strictly speaking, a waste of time. You're skirting around something which cannot be properly grasped. Now we can go back to the Lacanian idea of the sublime. If the sublime is the object elevated to the level of the thing, you realize that that is how we treat time. Time is simply the linear passage of finite being. Namely, in philosophical terms, not being, but becoming. As you are speaking, living, breathing, etc., you are negating. This is simply the principle of all negation. To be is to become, and to become is to negate. It's a simple formula. Think about it. Being is this essence, the ideal, something which is eternal, not subject to temporal passage of time. Of course, we idolize it because we are stuck in temporal becoming. We never simply are. We are existing. That's the, what people always understand about existentialism. It's not simply about, you know, oh, what is my purpose on life? in life? It's very much the problem, which is that to, to be is to exist. The very idea of existing without being, uh, becoming is impossible. I'm not explaining this very well. Think about it like this. If essence is eternal, essence is something that is not subject to becoming because it is not subject to finitude. It simply is, it's perfect. It doesn't, it's never corrupted, it never changes. It's immutable, it's eternal. Whereas everything in the world, life, is by its very definition finite. The transition of time is therefore not simply waiting to die, but it is life itself. Life, and here we go back to the beginning of the lecture, life equals death. Not life is a movement towards death, but life is absolute negation. Let me give you an example. I'm talking to you right now. Together, we are spending time. I am speaking, which means there are other things that I am not saying. I'm asking for your attention, which means there's other things that you aren't doing. When I eat something, I'm consuming something which comes from some other life form, whether it's meat, whether it's plants. Everything that I do, the air that I breathe is an act of negation. It is a taking, if you will, a receiving. That is the condition for my continued existence in a temporal sequence of time. Of course, love is, strictly speaking, also negation. Lacan's famous definition of love is giving somebody that which you do not have. Well, you could say in material terms, you give them all that you don't have, like, I don't have any money, so I'm not giving you my money, I'm giving you my love, all that I have is my love, etc. But it's more metaphysical than that. That which you do not have is time. You do not have time to give. And so when you're in love and you spend your life with that person, you are giving them that which you do not have. You are giving them time. Now, what this means, for philosophical terms, in philosophical terms, between Kronos and Kairos, is that Kronos is how we make sense of finite things, including ourselves. Kronos is the process of negation. And so when Plato says that life equals death, or life is a preparation for death, it's not simply how do you die well, or how do you live well, it's the understanding that within life lies the reenactment of death. Schopenhauer once said that when you wake up in the morning, it's like a little birth, and when you go to bed at night, it's like a little death. Now, Plato essentially has that same idea, except he inverts it, which is that while you're living, it's a little, it's a little death. In little increments, you are slowly expiring. It's very similar to the psychoanalytic principle of the death drive. The death drive, which I've explained here before, the death drive for Freud is not the movement towards death. It is not that you are, have like this, this nihilistic urge to self-destruct, which like um, is uh, often mischaracterized as being that. It's not like a Thanos. Part of it is that Thanatos, being related to the death drive, is often mischaracterized as being the desire to self-destruct. However, from a 
strictly speaking Freudian perspective, the death drive is implicit within all life, within all existence, that we feel most alive at the very moments in which we're doing something by which we put our subjectivity on hold. Think about how runners experience a so-called runner's high, where they're basically doing this rote mechanical repetition of running forever, and suddenly they feel like really good, elevated. Now, of course, there's a chemical reason for this in your brain and the endorphins that are released, but it is also the principle of the death drive, which is that when you're running, strictly speaking, you're not doing anything. It's like the exact point that you become detached from your own subjective investment that you feel most alive. It's how pleasure and pain aren't always opposites, that some people find pleasure and pain, that you feel in time at the exact point that the melancholic steps outside of time, etc. I've made this observation before, you may know it, but the French euphemism for an orgasm is the petit mort, or the little death. You feel most ecstatically alive at the point that you appear to check out. And this is one of the fundamental temptations, I believe, for all human beings, which is that secretly, we wish that we could hit the pause button on life. We wish that we could simply not exist. That existing is really exhausting. You're on all the time. Even when you're taking a break or doing nothing, your mind is still active. You don't simply get to check out of your mind. And so we do everything we can to escape our presence, whether it's engaging in arts or literature or in you know, having a partner or building a house or starting a new job or traveling. We're constantly escaping our inability to simply be because human beings never simply are. They are always in the process of becoming. It would be so wonderful if you could simply press the off switch on life, and yet you can't. It's also why one of the fundamental fantasies is to be present at your own funeral. The idea that you are not there, that you are looking at yourself lying in state as if you were looking at the grandfather and you think to yourself, here lies the essence of what I ought to be. The idea that you could detach from your own self to witness others looking at you without your own subjective investment is one of the most human fantasies that exists. And so what we tried to find is we tried to find fruitful ways to be content, fruitful ways to enjoy chasing our own tails, to feel productive and feel creative and feel like we're doing something that has lasting time. Now to go back to the Thomas Munn story and the baptismal bowl, we see here, of course, something which is supposed to symbolize not simply the transference of time amongst generation, but the bourgeois notion that it means something. Here we go back to Thomas Mann's irony. The baptismal bowl is self-important in the way that all heirlooms are, strictly speaking. It is a symbol of the family's continued, not only existence, but the family's continued importance, that the family meant something and that the family meant something to the society they lived in and that for generations they were respectable burghers who participated in politics and who had accumulated great wealth which they were able to pass on. In other words, we see here the idea of the family in bourgeois ideology is the object elevated to the level of the thing not simply the community of parents and children, but the idea of the family as a project, as a kind of corporation, as something which has to have a high status and value that can be transferred to the next generation. And of course, within the supplementing economic system to bourgeois ideology, namely capitalism, it is precisely the family unit that is the guarantor of wealth. Inheritance, for example, is how wealth is usually given on. That innate inherited privilege is the key social determinant for your own upward trajectory. And so the family becomes both the ideological supplement to capitalism, but it also becomes the relic, the object elevated to the level of the thing. And for anybody who's watched, for example, the Fast and the Furious series, you will understand perfectly how family is the object elevated to the level of the thing. 
In the Fast and the Furious series, the continual emphasis on family is very much the sort of cult-like ritualistic worship of something which is not really a family, right? It's something that has been created and something that has value, but it is also something that is deeply sentimental. The Fast and the Furious movies, apart from the uh, wonderful action sequences, are deeply, deeply sentimental films. They are absolutely melancholic and sentimental. They are nostalgia movies. And the funny thing is like, um, this is an aside, but I once saw that Drake characterized himself in a lyric as being someone who had created nostalgia rap. And that's what Drake's music is. It's the sort of the pleasurable melancholy of all the good times of past, etc. Now, to go back to the original theme of this lecture, namely the difference between Kronos and Kairos. From a metaphysical perspective, and this is like a key to understanding philosophy, if you want to really engage with any thinker, whether it's Heidegger's being in time, Zion on sight, whether it's Sartre's emphasis on existence, existentialism, uh, whether it's even, you know, the uh, difference between Aristotle and Plato, one of the fundamental foundational differences within the lineage of philosophy, we can trace uh, empiricism and analytical philosophy back to Aristotle and what we today would call theory or continental philosophy back to Plato, is the emphasis that is placed on temporal becoming, chronos versus kairos, the essence of time, the time of time itself. Now, within Platonic metaphysics, essence is the object, right? Essence is the ideal thing. It's the allegory of the cave. We have to exit the cave into the world of truth. In other words, in the cave, we have temporal existence, the passage of time, finite beings. And outside the cave, we have, the cave, we have eternal truth. We have essence, pure form, eternity. And the idea being that existence is always a lesser form of eternity. Now, what happens within, I'm gonna make a huge leap here, what happens within Kant and the critical inquiry into the conditions by which pure reason might be known is an emphasis on subjectivity. In other words, an opening in philosophical terms by which we place less of an emphasis on the eternal and more of an emphasis on the finite on the subjective conditions by which the eternal might be known. Kant therefore opens a door that leads directly to Hegel and Hegel's famous aphorism or maxim that substance equals subject, which it should be noted is also a proposition about time. If the central metaphysical binary between essence and appearance, between noumenon and phenomenon, between truth and objects, is also the division between eternity and finitude, Hegel's maxim, substance equals subject, namely absolute equals object, is therefore also eternity equals finitude. Eternity equals temporality. That the eternal is not that lies beyond the finite, that the eternal lies within the finite itself. And now you can start understanding, as we can trace in other lectures, and I have them before, how Hegel's so-called post-metaphysical turn, namely away from the idea of a transcendent essence beyond the world of appearances, displaces ontologically essence back into appearance itself, eternity back into finitude itself. And this opens up the so-called post-metaphysical anti-philosophers. After Hegel, the lineage of philosophy, those who try to keep philosophy alive are all anti-philosophers because they're no longer idealists in that strict sense of believing in the eternal beyond the finite. Marx is an anti-philosopher. Marx literally describes philosophy as being a form of intellectual masturbation. Ironically, of course, this is today what Marx is accused of by many people. Lacan, Freud, anti-philosophers in the extreme who believe that we have to focus on the unconscious and the subject of the unconscious, not the subject of essence, but the subject of unconscious. However, strictly speaking, the death drive 
And the idea of the death drive, namely of the internal within subjective negation, namely that negation is not the detraction of the eternal. Think about this. Traditionally, everything finite, everything in existence was supposed to be a negation of the eternal. We're back in the Platonic, Burkean sublime. Eternal essence is negated into subjective being. Now, if eternity lies within subjective being, then it means that subjective being is none other than negation raised to the level of the absolute. And now you can start connecting the dots and why Lacan is important here. If the sublime is the object elevated to the level of the thing, then what is subjectivity if not the object elevated to the level of the thing? In fact, what is finitude if not simply eternity raised to the level of the thing? In other words, rather than seeing the finite as the negation of the eternal, what if the eternal is the retroactive appearance of negation raised to the level of the absolute? Negation in the absolute, therefore, equals subjectivity, equals eternity, substance. And now we're back at Hegel's theory, his maxim, that substance equals subject. <clears throat> All of which leads us back, sorry for the technical aside, but that's for the more like advanced learners. All of which leads us back to the difference between chronos and kairos. Chronos, the temporal passage of time, linear existence, versus kairos, the principle, the essence of time itself. If time is itself negation, if time is itself the negation of itself, namely every moment is already the loss of a previous moment, then kairos is the undead, uncanny principle of time, which that strictly speaking, the essence of time is that it is hollow, that it is empty from within, that it is an abyss, that you can scratch away at the scabs of time, but there's nothing underneath. That time is the creation of a material substance around an absolute void. And this void is, of course, Kairos. Kairos is the crack within temporal existence itself, the essence of time, which is the essence of nothing, which you could also count, call nothing counted as something. And so if chronos is therefore something counted as nothing, namely every breath you take is a little step towards death, then kairos is the chiasmic antithesis to this, which is nothing counted as something. And so we find within these concepts, the two metaphysical keys is life that which crawls outside of the void, that which comes from the depths of the abyss? Or is life that which reconciles us with the transcendental horizon of completeness? The post-metaphysical Hegelian turn is to argue that neither are true. That strictly speaking, the suggestion that you could move upwards or downwards in time is itself a linear temporal sequence. Hence, why within Hegel's philosophy, the famous thesis, antithesis, synthesis is not a linear sequence. It's not you go from something which is to something which is negated to something which is sublated into its higher form, which itself would be a temporal argument. Instead, for Hegel, every thesis is itself always already synthesized in its own negation. This is what Hegel famously calls self-relating negativity. And the subject is this self-relating negativity. And the absolute is the object of self-relating negativity elevated to the level of the sublime. Now that's very technical. For those of you who are on YouTube, this might make a little bit more sense. Or not to disrespect people on Instagram, but YouTube is where I post more like abstract philosophy. Now, this leads me to my conclusion which is that if you want to understand the history of philosophy and the history of Western thought, it really helps to understand the difference between chronos and kairos, between the temporal sequence of time, chronos, and the indivisible remainder, if you will, within time itself. Namely, the fact that time is simply the description of a failure, a failure to be in time, that time is negation, that time is the passage of time, and that therefore the essence of time 
is a void, it's hollow, it's the temporality of time itself, and this is what we call kairos. And that this division between chronos and kairos corresponds to the age-old metaphysical division between essence and appearance. Appearance is finite. Appearance is that which exists in the world, objects in the world. An essence is supposed to be eternal and immutable. Hence why in every metaphysical proposition, going all the way back to even before Plato, think about Zeno's paradoxes, is about the relationship between the eternal and the finite, which is also about the relation between being and becoming, between essence and appearance. And once you understand those two poles, once you understand the two sides of the same coin, which is essence and appearance, noumenon, phenomenon, chronos, uh, sorry, kairos and chronos, once you have understand those, understood those two poles, everything else in philosophy opens up to you. That is the, the, the beating heart of every metaphysical inquiry, is the relationship between being and existence, eternity and finitude, between essence and appearance between noumenon and phenomena. That is the binary that lies at the heart of all metaphysics. And hopefully I've given you at least an introduction to those ideas. On that note, thank you guys so much for watching. If you are an Instagram subscriber, I'm gonna be hosting a live Q&A for another hour in which you can ask me any questions you might have about this lecture, about life, about anything, art, culture, politics. And if you're a patron, you can also download that Q&A as a podcast. I want to say thank you, everybody, for watching today. Thank you for being part of our learning community. Thank you to all our patrons on YouTube. Thank you to all our subscribers on Instagram. It has been my pleasure to host this session with you. And if you'd like to learn more, I would highly recommend that you join our Instagram subscription where I post daily beginners, 60 second clips, as well as reading recommendations. And if you're a more advanced learner, someone who would benefit from a more university level, course structure, please go over to my Patreon, which you can find on YouTube. It's www.patreon.com forward slash Jenlene and Julian. I'll put the link in the description where you can find all of my long form content. Thank you guys so much. And for the subscribers and patrons, I will see you in about five to 10 minutes in our live stream Q&A. Bye guys.